Is it okay? Is the sound going properly? Yes? Okay, so thank you, Michael. Very kind of you. I appreciate it very much. And thank you all for coming. I see a few familiar faces, and nice to see such a good turnout for science and spirituality in the teachings of Krishnamurti. So, I wanted to explain a little bit why I wanted to discuss this topic. And one of the reasons is that Krishnamurti, you know, is generally regarded as a spiritual teacher or a religious philosopher. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of his teachings are really just very matter-of-fact um, descriptions of consciousness. Um, his philosophy is really a, a form of psychology, uh, um, what you might call secular descriptions of ordinary consciousness. And he, he addresses the entire field of life and consciousness, so it's very hard to categorize him, but if you want to just put a very simple label on his work, I would call him a psychological philosopher. And so, um, um, you know, there, there might be an apparent contradiction between his general image as a religious teacher and the actuality of what the vast majority of his teachings are about. And so that raises the question, um, you know, what place does spirituality or religion or the religious mind actually have in this largely um, secular uh, philosophy? So that's one point. And another point is that the, um, historically, the relationship between science and religion has been, you know, very fraught. There have been periods of um, outright hostility, as well as other periods of a very uneasy relationship. And so it kind of raises the question, well, what about with Krishnamurti? What is his relationship with science? Is it, um, are they on friendly terms or kind of uh, kept at arm's length, or maybe even some kind of uh, opposition or antagonism between Krishnamurti's teachings and science. How does it all fit together in his philosophy? So those are two of the reasons why I wanted to raise this question, um, apart from just the sheer interest of the subject matter itself. And my hope is that by discussing this, we can learn um, not only about how these topics fit together in his work, but also maybe learn something about science itself and spirituality itself. So, I think that in order to understand Krishnamurti's view, we have to put it in a, kind of a large historical context. So I'd like to begin by going um, all the way back to the time of the Roman Empire. And in about the year 150, this fellow Claudius Ptolemy, who is a Roman mathematician, an astronomer, also an astrologer, he wrote several books which were very, very influential one of them is called The Almagest, which means Great Treatise. And that book really consists of 13 separate books. And in that book, he put together a comprehensive picture of the whole universe as it was understood in those days. And in the um, system that Ptolemy put together, the, what he called the celestial realm, which is really the universe, was a sphere. It was a perfect sphere. It was a fixed boundary. And within that sphere, Earth was at the absolute center, and Earth was unmoving. And the, you know, what you call the heavenly bodies of the moon and the sun and the planets were in rotation in perfect circles around the Earth at the center of the universe. And Ptolemy's system was extremely influential. It held sway in Western civilization for well over a thousand years, 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 years. And the reason it was so influential is because it brought together three different um, streams of uh, evidence. One is just the ordinary evidence of, of the 
naked eye, any man standing on the planet Earth sees the sun rising and setting and apparently, uh, you know, traveling in a circular motion around the Earth. And at night, the moon does something similar. And it's very natural to think that the Earth is stable and the heavenly bodies are moving around the Earth. And then in addition, the theological framework during most of that period also supported the idea that, you know, Earth was the primary thing. It was the, it was the, it was the center of the universe, not just geographically, but um, psychologically, spiritually. It's what God created and put man at the center, and man was the most important thing. So for Earth to be at the geographic center of the universe, and unmoving while everything else moved around it kind of reinforced that view of, of theology. And so then when Ptolemy came along and gave this point of view, the stamp of um, intellectual authority, it, it reinforced uh, that whole point of view um, and brought the whole thing together in a very strong, coherent way, which is why his system survived for so long. And in... Um, in Ptolemy's system, all of these heavenly bodies rotate around the Earth uh, in that sequence, the Moon closest, then Mercury, Venus, and then the Sun in his system, and then the other planets and the fixed stars. And this um, system was illustrated in charts like this, which shows the, um, the Earth at the center and the Moon, and there's the Sun and so on, everything rotating around the Earth. So this system held sway until um, uh, approximately 1550 or 1600. And what happened was that um, Nicholas Copernicus was, was born in 1473. And um, he was a mathematician, astronomer, physician, economist, and a diplomat. And at a relatively early age, when he was about 37 years old, in about 1510, he realized that the Ptolemaic system was n no longer accurate because he had a lot of, you know, much more, more detailed observations of the movement of the heavenly bodies. And he had already, by 1510, developed the idea of what you call a heliocentric universe. Um, helio is, means sun, and so heliocentric is a solar system where everything rotates around the sun. But he knew how tremendously controversial it would be to publish that idea in his day and age. So even though he figured it out in about 1510, he waited until the last year of his life, 1543, to publish his findings when he was 70 years old. And, um, and so he wrote this book called On the Revolution of the Celestial Spheres. And even though he had waited so long and, and he was getting... Uh, kind of old, he was still very hesitant to publish this. So he, ha he wrote an introduction which was uh, kind of addressed to one of the very prominent cardinals of the day. And it was kind of very apologetic and said, look, you know, all this stuff is really just uh, kind of philosophical speculation. It doesn't intrude on your theological territory. Don't, don't get too upset about it. And um, this is Copernicus. And um, so, so um, when his book was published, it didn't really make all that big a splash right away. In fact, by, um, by the end of the century, by um, about um, 1600 or so, it was said that there were only 15 astronomers in, in all of Europe, or really all the world, who believed in the uh, Copernican heliocentric system. And um, two of the people who believed in Copernicus' idea were um, Galileo and another guy named um, Giordano Bruno. Bruno was a priest who was born and raised in Italy. And uh, he was, from an early age, he was considered already controversial because um, when he was in his late teens or very early 20s, he was um, uh, in the monastery where he lived. Uh, it was discovered there was a book um, by Erasmus, which was hidden in what they called the, you know, the privy or the outhouse. And Erasmus was a 
was a, a very liberal theologian who had lived about um, 50 or 100 years before Bruno. And he, he although he was also, Erasmus was also a priest, but he was considered controversial because he promulgated ideas that were a little bit at odds with, um, with the Pope and Catholic theology. So when, um, when Bruno was discovered to have, um, it was discovered that Bruno was the one who had hidden that book in the privy of the monastery because he had put his notations in the margin, which um, they could recognize as handwriting. And so he got in a lot of trouble for that, and he had to leave Italy. And he traveled around in um, France and England. And Bruno had a, had a prodigious memory. He, had a, a, um, he developed a system for memorization, which he published in a book called um, The Shadows of Ideas. And whenever he traveled around to other countries, he was always able to move very quickly into the top intellectual circles because he could demonstrate his amazing memory and show off that way. So he was always pretty secure while he was traveling around. And during those 20 or so years that he was traveling in France and, and England, he wrote 34 books. I don't know if they were exactly books. They might have been like pamphlets, but call them 34 publications. And these were some of the ideas that Bruno developed. He said, he said, the universe is infinite, which was a very unusual idea in those days. And he said, the universe has no center. The earth is not the center. There is no center because the universe is infinite. He said, the distant stars are really like our sun and they have planets rotating around them. And one of his most controversial ideas was that the planets which rotate around those distant stars um, almost certainly have life forms on them, their own kind of um, animals and so on. And he said that God doesn't favor our Earth uh, over any of those other uh, planets out there that have their own life forms. So all of this was, of course, extremely controversial in his day. Oh, and he also, um, while he was at it, he said there's no such thing as the Immaculate Conception. He disagreed that Mary was a virgin when Jesus was born. And he said that Jesus was just an ordinary man, not a, uh, some kind of divine figure. So Bruno, um, when he was about 42 years old, he came back to Italy. And uh, he was working as a tutor for um, a couple of prominent families. And Bruno was very outspoken. And he got into trouble with the with one of the families, with one of the fathers of the kids he was tutoring, and he got reported to the Catholic authorities. They arrested him, and they put him in prison for seven years. And he'd spent his whole life studying, um, reading, and writing, and they put him in prison for seven years with no paper or pencil or anything. And at the end of that time, they put him on trial, and um, and they and he, he tried to reason with with the uh, with the Catholic Inquisition and just he tried to um, recant a little bit his point of view or say you shouldn't be too upset about it but they were having none of it they wanted the absolute total recanting or nothing and so they convicted him of heresy and when they did that um, he said perhaps you pronounce this sentence against me with greater fear than I receive it because he understood that the basis for the whole thing was the fear that his ideas created in the people who were interrogating him. So after he was uh, convicted um, at this trial, the uh, religious authorities um, took a, like a thin rope, like a cord, and they tied it around his tongue so that he could no longer speak any wicked words. And then they took him to the most um, public place in Rome, the great uh, market place, the public square, and they stripped him naked and they hung him upside down by his feet in the public square. And, and after they got tired of doing that, they cut him down and they tied him to a stake and they burned him alive. So that goes to show how extremely hostile the religious authorities were to, um, to um, you know, what they considered heretical ideas in those days. Now, the me next major development in the um, history of religion and science was the trial of Galileo, which is much better known than the trial of Bruno, because Galileo was a much more famous scientist. 
Galileo was getting in trouble with the religious authorities as early as about 1615, but, um, but the real trouble came in 1632 when he published this book called A Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. That was the Ptolemaic um, Earth-centered view versus the Copernican view. And uh, Galileo thought it was a very kind of even-handed and didn't show favoritism to one side or another, but the religious authorities disagreed and they, um, they forced him to, um, they forced him to recant, to say that he didn't believe in the Copernican system. Um, but even though he recanted, they still convicted him. And after they convicted him, he was known to have said, e per si muovo, meaning, and yet it moves. The earth moves around the earth, regardless of their uh, conviction of him. This is a painting from 1857 of the Inquisition, uh, the trial of, of Galileo. So they put him under house arrest for the last nine years of his life. Um, he went blind in uh, 1638, completely blind, but he was still kept in house arrest until he died in 1642. So the next major episode that we'll touch upon briefly in, the hist in this great conflict between um, religion and science was Darwin's publication of The Origin of Species in 1859. And kind of similar to what happened with Copernicus, Darwin figured out the basis of his idea many years before he published his book, but he knew how controversial it would be because the principle of natural selection displaces God as a designer of the um, very finely adapted um, nature of all the plants and animals. So Darwin knew how controversial that would be and, and waited as long as he could to publish his book. And the, the um, theory of evolution, you might not think so, but it's still extremely controversial, um, at least in the United States even today. Uh, the most recent poll, 38% of Americans disbelieve any form of evolution. They believe that God created man in his present form, period. There's another 38% who acknowledge that uh, human beings evolved over time but they say natural selection had nothing to do with it. It was a process that was guided by, by God. So only 24% of um, Americans in, as of uh, two or three years ago, subscribe fully to evolutionary theory. There's some hope though, because those ages 18 to 29, 50% of those subscribe to evolutionary theory. And this controversy between religion and science um, therefore is still active, it's still ongoing. And it's a very important thing for many reasons. One of them is that, you know, it contributes to the widespread um, denial of climate science. One, one of the reasons for opposition to climate science is that people, uh, quite a few people are skeptical about science in general. And one of the reasons they're skeptical about science in general is because they don't believe in Darwinian evolution. And similarly, they don't believe that man could be causing any changes in the climate because the climate is much too vast and man is too small. How could he possibly have any effect on something like climate? It must be God who's changing things. So this skepticism about um, the role of science, which has a very strongly religious base, is still very active in the world today. And it's important um, because of the way it influences um, important uh, public policies even today. Now this controversy between science and religion took a different turn in about 1975 when Fritjof Capra wrote this book called The Tao of Physics, an exploration of the parallels between modern physics and Eastern mysticism. This book was tremendously influential. It was translated into 23 languages, went through five editions in the United States. Um, one of the people who um, reviewed it said that it lucidly analyzes the tenets of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism to show their striking parallels with the latest discoveries in cyclotrons. Cyclotrons are the big machines that smash um, atomic particles together and produce um, 
you know, break up neutrons and protons into even sm smaller particles. And the study of that realm of physics is called quantum mechanics. And so Capra tried to show that there's a relationship between the findings of quantum mechanics and, um, and these uh, principles of um, Eastern mysticism. That's Capra. So, um, so Capra's book kind of uh, produced uh, almost a little industry of similar books over the course of the next 10, 20, 30 years that, uh, that tried to show that science and religion were somewhat compatible with one another, or maybe even reinforced one another a little bit. And uh, this whole movement got a big um, a boost of impetus from a guy named John Templeton. Uh, Templeton uh, was, a, was a very devout uh, Presbyterian. He was born in Tennessee, and then he went to live in England. And he made a huge quantity of money in the field of finance. And he felt there was not enough um, appreciation of spirituality in the modern world. So he, he created this thing called the Templeton Prize. And every year that prize is awarded, $1.4 million is awarded to somebody for what they call outstanding contributions in affirming life's spiritual dimension. And um, here are some of the winners of the Templeton Prize um, over the course of, uh, since 1973. And you know, you can see that um, there's uh, physicists and a biologist among these um, prize winners. Um, Richard Dawkins, uh, the famous British biologist. Um, he wrote a book called The God Delusion, and in it he said that the Temple Prize is usually awarded to some scientist who's prepared to say nice things about religion. And there's a, there's a you know, the, the whole thing is held um, not in very high regard by a lot of scientists. There's another um, Nobel Prize winning physicist who said, um, you know, that the, the concept of this is to what they call, say bridge the gap between science and religion and this Nobel Prize winning physicist said that what it does is it bridges the gap between sense and nonsense. <laughs> and so the, but anyway the Templeton Foundation has been extremely influential and they have done more than just award this prize. They've also, um, they have supported a lot of books that, um, that purport to show a relationship between uh, science and religion in the last um, 10, 20, 30 years. This is just a sample of some of the books. A couple of these books don't really um, seriously uh, try to show a significant relationship between science and religion like this book. It's not really about God at all, that, that God should be in quotation marks because he doesn't mean it seriously. It's just about a certain subatomic particle that kind of holds all the other subatomic particles together. So. Uh, it's called kind of tongue-in-cheek, the God particle. But these other books are pretty serious efforts to look at um, uh, a relationship between, between science and religion. So that's kind of the background that I wanted to describe, the historical background in which, uh, the context in which to see Krishnamurti's views, because Krishnamurti's perspective on these issues is really um, quite unusual and very interesting and it, the unusual aspects of it show up a little bit more clearly when you consider um, uh, the background in which it occurs. So I'm going to come at this um, Krishnamurti's views in a couple different ways. One way is just um, kind of analytical, um, drawing together some principles from Krishnamurti's teachings and the other way has to do with um, looking more directly at some uh, quotations from his um, teachings. So, so it, th this is the beginning of a list of ways in which Krishnamurti's approach and the approach of science are in complete agreement. Krishnamurti is so strong that nothing in his teachings should be accepted on the basis of any kind of authority. He feels it's very important in the whole psychological field for 
nobody ever to just accept things on the basis of any form of authority, personal authority or some so-called sacred text or any kind of faith or belief in the psychological field. Christian Rudy absolutely castigates and is against um, very strongly. He's, he's, you could even say he's more strongly against these things than uh, science is. But, uh, but in any case, science and Christian Rudy both completely agree in rejecting um, these approaches to their subject matter. Here's another set of, um, of areas in which science and Krishnamurti agree. Um, they both consider the process of inquiry to be uh, extremely important. That's absolutely fundamental to Krishnamurti's whole approach. And um, the other day I asked a friend of mine who's a very good scientist what he considers to be um, whether or not he considers there to be anything sacred in the field of science. And he said, inquiry, the process of inquiry. And science and Krishnamurti are both very strongly observational. They are, um, their approach is empirical in the sense it's based on facts. And it's even experimental. They both have that in common. Krishnamurti's experimentation is not like a formal scientific experiment, but he felt that one should uh, study oneself um, in an experimental spirit, uh, without any preconceived ideas as to the outcome, and, uh, and with close observation of um, the relationship between cause and effect in terms of um, you know, your inner psychological dynamics. Now, there are some areas where the approach of Krishnamurti and the approach of science differ. Um, I'm not going to say that they disagree. They don't disagree, but they differ in the sense that uh, they have different subject matters. The subject matter of science is the outer world. The subject matter of Krishnamurti is looking inwardly at the psychological field. Krishnamurti has no quarrel with a theory or analysis or scientific method as it's applied to the outside world, but he says when you're looking inwardly, those things don't work. Um, we don't have to go into the details as to why. The point is just that he feels that looking inwardly analysis is not helpful. Um, any form of theory will just get in your way of observing clearly what's going on. And similarly, um, you know, the, the, the place of knowledge in the psychological field is a very important area of Krishnamurti's philosophy. He feels that knowledge looking inwardly is very often an impediment to clear observation. Whereas in the outer world, of course, knowledge is important and it's fundamental to science. And Krishnamurti completely endorses uh, the, um, the significance of knowledge for science. But, um, but they part company in terms of these issues only because they have different subject matters, not because Krishnamurti has any quarrel at all with how science proceeds for its own subject matter. So this is something about how um, Krishnamurti and, and science are related to one another from an analytical point of view. But before we look um, in, in more detail at the actual teachings, I think we should also consider Krishnamurti's attitude towards spirituality um, uh, in an abstract, analytical way. Krishnamurti doesn't really endorse mysticism, per se. Um, he does, the, the concept of mysticism really doesn't enter into his teachings. And, um, and the whole idea of mysticism uh, doesn't have a flavor that fits in very comfortably with his teachings. And the role of religion in Krishnamurti's teachings is interesting because on one hand it is very, very strongly negative in the sense that he, he uh, at every opportunity, he finds reasons to um, strongly criticize religious organizations, the way religion is normally presented in the world uh, based on faith and belief. But at the same time, he also describes something that he calls a true religious spirit. And that is something that he very strongly endorses. So he has a positive and negative view towards religion, depending upon how you construe it. 
So these uh, concepts of spirituality, mysticism, religion, that these words are um, a little bit loaded and they have somewhat um, uh, uh, hazy meanings in some respects. And so in, in researching this talk, I thought it would also be interesting to get at, um, instead of the label of spirituality or religion, get at something closer to the actual essence of it, which is what is sacred? Is there something that is sacred in Krishnamurti's teachings? And the answer to that is most definitely yes. And so um, this will take us, I think, closer to the heart of um, spirituality and religion uh, for Krishnamurti. So now that's, that's kind of an abstract analytical approach, but now let's come a little bit closer to the actual teachings and see more concretely what it is that he has to say in this field. And so I, I, have, um, I have drawn out three or four or five um, basic positions that Krishnamurti holds that uh, bear upon this issue. So Krishnamurti is interesting because he says the religious mind contains the scientific mind. That's a very interesting and unusual point of view. The religious mind is a mind that is capable of thinking precisely, clearly, sharply, which is the scientific mind. The religious mind contains the scientific mind, but the scientific mind cannot contain the religious mind because that, that being the scientific mind, is based on time, on knowledge, on achievement. So this is quite um, an un interesting and unusual point of view. Um, let me just elaborate on this a little bit. Um, Krishnamurti says, we know what the scientific spirit is the spirit of inquiry, of never being satisfied with what it has found. It is the scientific spirit which has built the industrial world, but an industrial world without an inward revolution brings about a mediocre form of living. Now, it is much more difficult to find out what is the religious spirit. How does one go about it when one wants to discover something true? We want to find out what is the true religious spirit, not the strange spirit that prevails in organized religions, but the true spirit. And then he, uh, he discusses what he calls negative thinking, which, is, um, which he says is the highest form of thinking. And he says negative thinking consists of breaking through falseness, breaking through illusion. And that's what he identifies with the religious, true religious spirit or religious state of mind. He says, so the, the mind can come to that religious state and I'm using the word, word religious to convey something totally new, not related to the re religions of the world, which are all dead, dying, decaying. So the next point that Krishnamurti makes in this um, territory, he says, organized religions are based on thought. All our religions throughout the world are based on thinking, on thought. All the gods, all the rituals, all the religious structures, cathedrals, temples, all the rest of that put together by thought. There is nothing sacred about it. All the religions, all the books, there is nothing sacred about it. Very um, emphatic uh, position that ties together religion, thought, and sacred and makes very clear <laughs> how he distinguishes among those. In addition, he says, that thought has created God. Thought has created God. Would you be shocked by that? Thought has created it. Out of our misery, despair, loneliness, anxiety, we have invented that thing called God. And um, somewhere else he says, um, he says, so you all believe in different ways, but your belief has no reality whatsoever. Reality is what you are, what you do, what you think, and your belief in God is merely an escape from your monotonous, stupid, and cruel life. <laughs> Furthermore, belief invariably divides people. You may bring a few people together in a group, but that group is opposed to another group. So ideas and beliefs are never unifying. On the contrary, they are separative, 
disintegrating and destructive. Therefore, your belief in God is really spreading misery in the world. So that's pretty emphatic um, rejection, right, of organized religion, of the concept of God, um, uh, of the role of thought, the ro thought per se. He is very strong. It has nothing sacred whatsoever about it. So to look more deeply into uh, this subject matter, I think it's time that we have to consider, okay, you know, Christian really is pretty strong against um, organized religion, against thought, against the concept of God. What does he consider to be sacred? So I wonder um, if any of you would like to make any guesses as to what Krishnamurti considers to be sacred. If any of you know or want to guess, you could offer it. I'm sorry? Himself. Life. Love. Truth. Beauty. Okay. So, um, very possibly many or most of those things he might consider sacred, but the one that he emphasizes above all else and comes back to over and over is truth. Krishnamurti says the most sacred thing is truth. Truth is the most sacred thing, but truth cannot come through the operation of thought. It comes when there is total order in your life. Come into being only when there is compassion, and compassion has its own intelligence, not the intelligence of the cunning mind. So this is so central and so important and brings us so close to the heart of Krishnamurti's sense of spirituality that I have several slides which illustrate um, the most important thing is truth, the most sacred thing. The moment you put into words what is truth, it is not. Truth is indescribable. And that thing which is the most sacred can only be when the mind is absolutely quiet. You cannot find truth. You cannot set about deliberately, consciously to find it. You must come, up, come upon truth darkly, unknowingly. But you cannot come upon it if your mind is not completely, totally free. And so then in the next slide, we're going to see something surprising because um, after so categorically rejecting um, God in some of our previous discussions, now suddenly God is going to make a reappearance because Krishnamurti um, occasionally, not often, but every once in a while when he discusses this, he identifies truth with God. Now, this is not, um, you know, your concept of God or the God of organized religion. And he, uh, he qualifies it um, by saying truth or God or what you will, which implies that whatever label you put on it is, um, is an insignificant matter. But he does use the word God. So God or truth or what you will is a thing that comes into being from moment to moment. And it happens only in a state of freedom and spontaneity, not when the mind is disciplined according to a pattern. So let me um, elaborate on this a little bit. He says, to understand what is and to change what is, is the way of religious life. To find out why we suffer, go into it very, very deeply and end that suffering, end fear and understand the whole structure of pleasure, which is our consciousness. And to transform that consciousness is the responsibility of every human being who is serious, who is really religious. It is only the religious mind that can go within. And the going within is not in terms of time and space. The going within is limitless, endless, not to be measured by a mind that is caught in time. And the religious mind is the only mind that is going to solve our problems. 
because it has no problems. Any problem that exists is absorbed and dissolved on the instant. Therefore, that mind has no problems. So in that sense of the word religious, a revolution is necessary in each one of us. A total revolution, not partial. It is only such a mind that can be intimate with truth. Only such a mind can be friendly with God or whatever, whatever name you like to give it. So that's more or less as far as I can take it. I think it's more or less as far as we can go in terms of trying to describe what Krishnamurti regards as um, sacred um, and especially vis-a-vis -vis what he regards as the um, uh, scientific mind or scientific spirit. But I like to add um, a kind of a little footnote in the sense that um, as, as Michael was mentioning, I wrote this book called um, An Uncommon Collaboration about the relationship be between Krishnamurti and Bohm. And I had a lot of discussions with Bohm uh, on topics similar to this relationship between science and philosophy and religion. And I was looking through those in preparing for this talk. And I ran across something which I didn't remember discussing with him, but which I think is relevant. Bohm said that, um, Bohm brought in the question not of sacred, but of virtue. Virtue is, I think, also closely related to these issues. And he said that, um, he said that for Krishnamurti, attention is the supreme virtue. And I, um, I didn't remember exactly Krishnamurti saying that, so I looked up in, in uh, the Krishnamurti teachings online, and I couldn't find Krishnamurti saying attention is supreme virtue, but I could find him saying attention is virtue. And in my conversations with Bohm, he brought this out in the sense that he said that attention can be what he called a bridge between the finite and the infinite. And so to that extent, I think uh, as kind of a footnote, it's relevant to all of this. And, um, and I found some things that Krishnamurti said about attention. He said, attention is when your mind is aware of every movement that is taking place within itself and outside. It implies not only hearing all the noises of the buses, the cars, but also what is being said and being aware of your reaction to what is being said without choice. So the mind has no frontier. And he said, such attention is goodness, such attention is virtue, and in that attention there is love. An attentive mind that is completely aware of itself and all the things within itself, such a mind is then capable of going beyond itself. And I think that that form of attention is related to what Krishnamurti called meditation. And he said, so meditation is freedom from the known, which is the measure. And in that meditation, there is absolute silence. Then in that silence alone, that which is nameless is. So looking back at what we have said about the, um, the historical development of religion and science and then Krishnamurti's relationship to all of that, um, you know, we saw that early on there was a period where religion was very hostile to science and that gave way later to a period where um, religion and science were a kind of co-equal, um, separate, each one going its own way and not worrying too much about what the other one was doing. And then more le recently, beginning um, approximately with Fritjof Capra and the Templeton Foundation, um, we have found an area where some people are saying that religion and science can overlap or uh, have some way of you know, reinforcing one another. And then Krishnamurti comes along and he says, religion contains science. It's a very, very interesting and unusual and uh, different point of view. 
So we started this inquiry with two questions, and I think we've answered what is the relationship between science and spirituality and the teachings of Krishnamurti, but there is the larger question of what is the role of um, spirituality and the teachings as a whole? And, um, and why is it that the teachings are so predominantly a description of what you could call secular psychological issues, and he really doesn't spend very much time talking about these um, spiritual or what he would call true religious matters. And, and I think we've come across a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is that, um, uh, you know, he says that, um, he says the most sacred thing is truth, and truth cannot be described. Truth is that which you cannot put into words. And so that makes it very difficult to talk about at any length um, in one of his public talks. And uh, related to that, um, you know, he said, you can only discover truth if, if your own mind is absolutely free and if your life is in complete order. And, uh, and how many of us can say that, you know, our mind is absolutely free and our life is in complete order? And so his teachings are, uh, are concerned with addressing us at the level where we live. And, and therefore, the teachings are addressed to um, how can our minds be free or how can our life be in order and leave the sacredness of truth um, to come upon, if you can, once the primary things are taken care of. And then um, I just want to point out also what an unusual meaning, you know, Krishnamurti supplies to that word truth because ordinarily, you know, we use the word truth to describe a characteristic specifically of something that someone says. That's, the, that's normally how we use that word truth. It's, it's what someone says that is either true or not true. Um, you know, when people have to take an oath, they, they swear to, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But you know, suppose somebody went, was asked to take that oath and they said, well, sorry, I can't take that oath because uh, truth cannot be described. Truth, truth cannot be put into words, right? So, but, but Krishnamurti is saying that about truth. And, um, you know, in, in my book, An Uncommon Collaboration, in one of the last chapters, I review a lot of characteristics, not a lot, but half a dozen characteristics of Krishnamurti, which um, which are extremely unusual. Each one by itself is unusual. And when you put them together in the aggregate, they, um, they add up to what I consider to be an individual completely um, unique in the history of, of um, humanity. And, but now I think we can add a new item to the list because if you think of the way that Krishnamurti has described truth or defined it, he says, it's something that you cannot find if you go looking for it. He says it can only be discovered if your mind is completely free and your life is in order. He says it's something which is moment to moment and spontaneous. He says it's something which is impossible to put into words or describe. And I think that constellation of characteristics makes his attitude towards truth uh, very, very unusual. I don't know, there may have been other people who describe truth in that way. If there are, I don't know who they are. But at the very least, I think it's very unusual, and I think we can uh, kind of maybe add that to the list of um, highly unusual and interesting characteristics of, of Krishnamurti and his work. So, that is what I had to say about science and spirituality and the teachings of Krishnamurti. And, and um, what time is it? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, I think we have a few minutes for questions.
Um, you described uh, the most sacred uh, as being the truth, and in Sanskrit there is uh, the concept of concept of Satchitananda, which is you know truth, awareness, and bliss. So, uh, is it like a, is it a simultaneous thing, or or is it like uh, you shoot for truth and you end up with awareness and bliss, you know? Uh, personally, I can't tell you, because I don't know, but I think that Krishnamurti would say that awareness is something that we can all have and do have uh, from time to time uh, of certain things. Truth uh, is, a, is, a, is kind of a state of mind, which he says very, 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 very few people come across. He, he used the word very four times in a row when he said that. Very, 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 very few people come across that state of mind. And so, and so it would be difficult to describe what characteristics go with it, but I think bliss uh, very likely is, is associated with that very unusual state of mind. So to that extent, I think, yeah, they probably go together. First of all, thank you, David. Sure. Very nice presentation. Thank you. And I, uh, because you've studied Krishnamurti so long and you've been so involved with the, the teachings for years, I'm interested in hearing your perspective on something I, I've come across Krishnamurti saying in several dialogues and in some of the publications that I pondered for many, many years. And this work lines beautifully with that. So I'm interested in hearing you talk a little bit more about what Krishnamurti would say, the brain must be safe. The brain must feel safe. And in here, you're containing a lot of context around that. I'd be interested in your perspective on what you think he meant by that. What did he mean when he would say the brain must be safe or must feel safe? Yeah, that's a very interesting part of the teachings, isn't it? He says yeah. that many times, says the brain demands security, must have security. And he, um, you know, he maintains that, um, you know, th this is why, um, this is one of the reasons why fear is so destructive. Fear, um, in Krishnamurti's view, it disrupts the proper functioning of the brain. The brain must have security um, in order to uh, function properly um, in an orderly, harmonious manner. And, and um, part of the difficulty comes because a thought is the product of the brain. The brain produces thought. It's, in Krishnamurti's view, you know, it's not as though there is this um, psychological entity, this non-material entity called the thinker or the self, which is producing thought. It's the brain which is producing thought. And because the brain demands security, thought demands security. But thought gets mixed up because thought does not understand itself. And the combination of those two things, that, it's, that thought um, is demanding security but does not understand itself and misunderstands its own function, those are kind of the preconditions which get us into all kinds of tangles and difficulties and confusions because, because um, thought ends up um, seeking security for itself. And Christian Rudy maintains that there, there is no security. There's no real security, but there's a kind of security in intelligence. But intelligence does not function when um, thought is, is running around and, and mixing everything up. Those are not his words. I put it in brief terms, right? And, and, so, um, and so he thinks it's important to understand the nature of security and the nature of thought, and then intelligence can function, which brings its own security. And then, and then the brain uh, functions in a harmonious and, um, um, I don't know what words to use, more constructive, uh, functional manner.
thank you for presenting Krishnamurti Sidon teachings. Uh, I haven't ever really heard such a clear outline the way you did it. Um, however, I have some questions because it sounds like his process is the process of inquiry, observation, empirical, and experimental. But if we actually look at that and we start with the real process of inquiry, we have to start with the fact that as human beings, we suffer from illusions, flaws, imperfect senses, and the propensity to cheat. And if we actually look at that real carefully and real seriously, we recognize that we make mistakes and we're actually very seriously flawed by design, which seems to put us into a corner where we, we can't really figure anything out on our own. And it seems like the way you ended your lecture when you talk about truth, and you explained it very nicely. He said, it's not this. You can't get it like this. You know, you went through a whole series of things. Um, <clears throat> to me, it kind of reflects the very fact that, well, maybe the whole concept of truth, the way he's presented it, that's also wrong. And that we should also be inquiring about instead of just simply accepting it. So I, I'm, I'd like to hear how you would explain how we can actually figure anything out if we can recognize through observation, how seriously flawed we are as people, as the design of the human being. Well, I don't know if I can answer your whole entire question, but one thing I would say is that Krishnamurti would absolutely agree with you. Don't take his word for it with respect to what is truth. He would, he would agree with you more than you agree with it. Don't take his word for it. Truth, whatever it is, um, if you uh, find it, fine, and if it has a meaning for you, fine, but don't find it because he said it, and don't accept his word for it. And so it's in that sense that um, he's recommending a process of inquiry where, yes, it's a challenge because we are flawed and we are subject to illusion. And so then that becomes part of the challenge of the inquiry, is to discover the nature of our illusions, the source of the illusions, and to see them for what they are. Um, yeah, it, 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 it makes it difficult, truly. But that's part of the challenge, it's part of what makes it interesting, also. I think there's a question back here, and then you? Okay. Um, <clears throat> part of what it enamored me, uh, to Christianity was uh, some of his Lewis Carroll and kind of logic. Uh, the thinker is a thought. The thought, the questions are the answers. You know, you ask the right question. If you answer the right question, the answer comes with the with the question. Yeah. Um, but there was one thing um, that he kind of aligned himself with uh, Western psychology. I think in a way, projection. If you seek the truth, you will find the truth you seek. But it won't be the truth. It'll be a projection of your own mind. Have yeah. you run across that idea? Yes. Yeah. Right. So the, you, you pointed that out in your lecture. You can't seek the truth. The truth comes. So, it um, comes darkly. <clears throat> he said, uh, another place I couldn't find the quote, he said, it, it comes yes. like a thief in the night. Yeah. Uh, right, right. Uh, so... Um, so, and it's the quiet mind, which is medi which he would point out as being meditation. I think his idea of meditation, that uh, you don't seek it in that meditative state, whatever, you know, insight or, or epiphany will come, not to be sought, because you'll seek your own mind, which is your thought, which is created by conditioning, your past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all the ideas that we have filled in our heads. So um, <clears throat> I always um, was, uh, 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 and, and in a way he was, also, uh, he, he was also aligned with some, you know, the, the great, the know thyself. I mean, who was this person who was seeking? You know, if you don't know that, then you will find the truth, but it won't be the truth. It'll be the projection of your own mind right of your own thought of your own past of your own conditioning be it christian or buddhist or communist or whatever you know yeah 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 uh and uh to me 
and I love that. The thinker is a thought. Thought creates the thinker. That's yeah. your ego, right? Yeah, yeah. So in a strange way, yes, he did align himself with some of the Western psychology, although he argued greatly with the psychologists, you know. Yeah. Uh, in the in the, but um, he did. I thought that that really resonated with me personally. You know, that uh, that idea of projection. Yes, mm. you will find the truth. You'll find your own mind, which is which is not the truth. It's yeah. your conditioning, right? Yeah. Is that? Yes, yes. You know, the, here, here's the thing. This is something interesting that, um, I don't know, some of you might know um, Dr. Krishna, who, who's been visiting here lately. Something he pointed out, which is that all kinds of people have seen things which are true and have said true things. And so you'll find various people who have said things which are similar to what Krishnamurti has said. And, and, and this is one of the ways in which people try to say, oh, Krishnamurti, put him in this category, this category, this category, right? And so I concur that, you know, there are probably a few things in his teachings which are, you know, similar to what you might call Western psychology. And... And it's an interesting uh, thing, the relationship of Krishnamurti to Western psychology. I think that there's a whole field of um, what you might call some kind of psychotherapy, which has yet to be developed, which is uh, based very strongly in Krishnamurti's teachings and has not yet been developed. I think there's a very fertile field there. You know, the, um, the commentaries on living consist uh, mostly of you know people who have come to see Krishnamurti and poured out their personal problems the way they would to a psychotherapist, and he answers them in a very interesting and novel and insightful way. And he's you know he doesn't take any money for it, and he doesn't have a degree, but it's a form of what you might call loosely psychotherapy. And I think that his teachings generally, um, especially as illustrated by the commentaries on living. You know, if I were a psychotherapist, I would draw upon that. I would find some way to, to um, use that in my practice. And I think there's a, a big um, field waiting to be developed. And another interesting thing about that is that, um, you know, there was this psychiatrist, David Shainberg, in New York, that Krishnamurti, you know, that David Bohm was, knew very well, and the three of them had uh, a series of dialogues together. And there was a period of time, uh, I think mostly in the 1970s, when Krishnamurti went to New York every year and um, had a series of meetings with psychotherapists in New York, people that Shainberg had gathered together. And um, I haven't yet, ha I have, I recently um, got a set of transcripts of those dialogues and I haven't had a yet, yet had a chance to go through them, but it's one of the things that is, um, you know, I want to get into next in my study of Krishnamurti because I think there's very fertile, interesting material to be um, to be kind of excavated in that territory. That yeah, yeah. Do we have a somebody a question a question from online? Is that what's happening? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for confirming that uh, Krishnamurti said we shouldn't follow him either because he may have his own conditionings. That was a little, you know, I found that very honest and truthful because a lot of things I find quite complicating, a lot of word jugglery, and I'm finding difficulty in understanding when you say, like, for example, you know, don't take any authority, you know. For, in the psychological field. Any uh, psychological field, it in seems the like even religious field. You know, field. if you're talking about about a lawyer or a doctor, you know, a field of knowledge, it may be appropriate to accept someone's authority. But when you're what about, about religious field? No. Right. So you know, like you say, if you want to learn medical science, you go to an authority for that. Yeah, if you want that's to learn engineering, you go for an authority for that. If you want to learn anything, you go to an authority for In that. The field but of if knowledge. you want to learn religion or psychology, you don't go to an authority for that. Is that no, what you're saying? That's correct. Unless you, if you want to learn, you know, if you want to go, if you want to treat religion as a field of knowledge, 
like if you're a graduate student, you know, and studying comparative religion, then you would want to know what knowledge, you know, we have about different um, religious traditions. Then you might accept authority. But if you're interested yourself seriously in finding real um, religious truth, if you want to put it that way, no authority. And not just religious, anything in the psychological field. He said, self-knowledge, self-understanding, any authority will just block you from seeing what you yourself actually are. I find that quite confusing. <laughs> <laughs> It's different. No, 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 no. I never said it's impossible. It just means we had need to study those. I never said it's impossible. I said that presents a challenge to the process of inquiry, certainly a challenge, but it Uh, okay, um, I think we had a woman over here that had a question, and then Francisco had a question from online, right? Push it up. Yeah, it seems like uh, Krishnamurti said there is a prerequisite to perceiving truth, which is, you know, as you were mentioning, um, a total freedom, and um, the other one was uh, order. Order. Order, right? So, prerequisite, however, implies time, right? And he he said many, many times that time should is is irrelevant when it comes to perceiving truth. So, how do you reconcile the two? It, at one statement is about having a prerequisite, which implies definitely a, a, a time, a timeline. But then he says that it, it's an immediate um, perception. I don't think he would agree that it implies time. But it's a pre well. I don't think I don't think he would agree that it's a process of becoming. But if you do recognize that there is no that the mind is not completely free or there's not complete order, then to get to that, there is time, right? No? Not in Krishnamurti's view. In the way we ordinarily think about it, yes. But not in Krishnamurti's view. He, he would maintain that, um, that the way to freedom, the way to order is insight, and that insight is instantaneous. There's not a series of steps you go through in order to achieve that. On the contrary, he would say that the, um, he would say that's part of our conditioning, and it's one of the reasons that um, we're in so much trouble is because we're so stuck on this idea that there um, is some, what he would call psychological evolution, a process of, of improvement, which will get us to the promised land. He said it doesn't work that way. The way it works is to see what he calls negative thinking, right, which is to see that source of illusion which is functioning in me now and by seeing the illusion it dissipates it and then the mind becomes clear but it's not a it's not a time bound sequence hello um, having attended some of Krishnamurti's talks was the uh, thing I realized was the j journey to truth was a pathless, uh, uncharted territory. Truth is a pathless land, he said. Right. He did. So, uh, having uh, tried several techniques, the psychologists tell me that about 96% of our uh, concerns or fears come from a physiology which is not, and we use our brain through meditation, and the brain is trying to manage the brain. So how do we step away and journey to the truth? Is there a technique that uh, you could suggest? So, you know, there, I made that list of um, places where 
Christian religion differs from science. In science, you have the scientific method, and it's very reliable. It's done amazing things to produce, you know, what you call verifiable knowledge. But Krishna Ruddhi is very emphatic that in exploring inwardly, you cannot have a method. As this fellow was saying, you know, if you have a method, it's like um, you have kind of predetermined the thing. You will end up only discovering what the method itself produces. And so he just, he advocates what he calls choiceless awareness, pure observation. Um, there's no method for that. There's no system. There's no technique, uh, but it's something that you do um, if you have, you know, what he calls this religious spirit, which is which is dedicated to understanding what is. If you have that dedication to understanding what is, you will observe what is, and in the process of observing it, the change comes, not because you've applied a technique, but the observation itself precipitates a transformation. And letting go of fear in the process. Letting go of fear, but not just letting go of it, understanding it. In the understanding of it comes the, um, comes the dissipation of it. Um, we, we have a question from, uh, by Jonas, he's online. Uh, Jonas. Jonas. Uh -huh. It seems that thought can represent the senses so that we do not have a direct experience of the senses, but only through thought. What place do the senses and thought have when it comes to inquiring into the problems in oneself? So, right, the senses bring me in contact with the world. The senses enable me to, to see nature or to hear uh, the song of a bird. Thought comes along and uh, and and forms a filter between me and my sensory observation, and and that's a process that I can observe. I can see how thought does that. I can look at the rose, and I can see that there's one thing when I look at the rose, which is pure observation, but then thought comes along and names the rose and tells me, you know, what, what specific variety of rose that is and describes what is that exact color. And that operation of thought interferes with my observation of the actual flower. Okay, so then I can see that process outwardly in a simple form like that. Then I can also, having discovered that process looking outwardly, I can see that something similar occurs inwardly because um, I discover that I'm jealous, right? Because my girlfriend does something that I really don't like and it precipitates this uh, response in me. And so uh, and I'm, you know, I'm dealing with that response. I'm labeling it. I'm judging it. I'm trying to figure out, and all that is a process of thought, which separates me from the actual reaction in and of itself. And Krishnamriti says that separation is the basis for not being able to understand it fully. So sensory reaction, thought, seeing the relationship and how one interferes with the other can um, kind of predispose you to see a similar dynamic in terms of self-understanding, uh, uh, inward observation. Thanks, Davy. Uh, you are the first teacher in the school, right? Yeah. So when you first start uh, teach in the school, so does Chris Krishnamurti do some coaching on you how to teach the kids? <laughs> so I wrote a whole book about that, right? <laughs> it my, the previous book that I wrote called The Unconditioned Mind was um, very directly about, you know, what it was like to move up here from West LA and 
te we just we only had half a dozen students, and um, uh, this this building didn't exist then. But in in its place, there was a very um, sort of ugly, um, long, narrow, rectangular room, which was right adjacent to Krishnamurti's cottage. And so, um, at certain times of the year, he would be um, in Ojai, um, in you know, in his pine cottage, and we, I would be teaching in the classroom, you know, with these kids, separated by just a wall from Krishnamurti. And I used to wonder, you know, if he could hear us, <laughs> or if he knew what we were, you know, by um, mental telepathy, if he knew what was going on. <laughs> and so, it was, um, you know, it was really something to to try to implement his teaching philosophy in that setting when I was not an experienced teacher. I didn't have anything or very little to draw upon. And so it was, it was a very challenging, um, it was a very challenging period of time. So as for, you know, his coaching, he, no, he didn't give any like um, direct personal coaching to me, but what he did do is he um, conducted a series of meetings with the teachers and the um, uh, other school staff and the trustees of the foundation and sometimes the parents of the students would come. There would be 20, 30, 40, 50 people and he would have a, a meeting with us for an hour, an hour and a half. And you know, he would start off maybe talking for 10 or 15 minutes you know, describing how he saw the um, intention of the school, what the school was trying to achieve and what the difficulties would be. But he would, you know, he would couch it in, in very sort of comprehensive and deep um, psychological terms, you know, consistent with his whole philosophy. And then, you know, having put that out, the people in the room would, you know, start trying to interact with him and say, does it mean this or does it mean that? Or he might put out questions and try to elicit responses from the people. And those meetings, he had the first year of the school, I think there were like 14 or 15 meetings of that kind. Um, um, after I left the school, I ended up transcribing those meetings. And some of them have been uh, published in a book, which is uh, now available in the bookstore. What is, it? is that called? Insights into Education, Michael? Is that what it's called? Insights into Education. So you can read it. You know, it's all there, um, exactly how he tried to um, deal with it. And personally, um, I wouldn't say those meet. I personally did not find those meetings very helpful in terms of what I was trying to do in the classroom, okay? <laughs> and um, so, you know, I, I wrote about all this in, in my book. I'll just tell you like one little episode, right? I was a, I had, I had done a lot of private tutoring, but I never taught in a classroom before. So I didn't know how to cope with a group of students, even though we only had half a dozen students the first year. Um, and so, you know, one of my problems was, wh what do you do when a, when a, it was a very simple problem, right? What do you do when a student in the classroom misbehaves in some manner? Because Christian, part of Krishnamurti's philosophy was, um, you know, um, you know, there are quite a few so-called progressive schools which say um, we're not going to use punishment. We're not going to use punishment as a mode of disciplining the students, right? We're going to find other ways to deal with them. So Krishnamurti went along with that. He said no punishment, but at the same time, he also said no reward. He took away both ends of the thing, right? He said, and, and thirdly, at the same time, he said the student's um, behavior should be exemplary, <laughs> right? <laughs> he said the student should exhibit, um, you know, uh, uh, very sensitive, thoughtful, considerate behavior, but as a teacher, you can't use either reward or punishment to bring that about, right? <laughs> so. So there you are in the classroom and you have, you know, all these, this sense of what is the intention of the school, but there's your kids and they're doing stuff they shouldn't be doing, right? So what, what then, right? Then what do you do? And so, um, so I brought that to um, Krishnamurti, the first um, personal um, conversation, one-on-one -on -one that I had with him was right over here in the back of his cottage. I went up, I just got desperate. It was like two months into the school. 
and I went back there and I knocked on the door and, and uh, Mary Zimbalist let me in and we talked for like 15 minutes in his kitchen. And I didn't know how to talk with him. I was so in awe of him, you know, and I didn't really know how to broach these things very well. So, so we just sat down and I said to him, Sir, I said, what is the law in the classroom? That was the way I phrased it at the time. And he goes like this. <laughs> and then, but then, you know, and then he started talking. He said, well, he said, what he said at that particular moment, he says, you, what you want to do is create an atmosphere in the classroom. He said, you want to create an atmosphere that, is, that um, envelops the child in a sense of care, where the child feels really deeply taken care of. And in that atmosphere, he said, the child just won't misbehave. misbehave. And he likened it to um, a church, where uh, you know, a church has, a very, has such a special atmosphere that if you go into a church, you couldn't possibly smoke a cigarette. It just it, it wouldn't, it couldn't be done. It wouldn't be done, he said. And so that was one um, suggestion he had. L later on in the year, we developed some, some other uh, tools, you might call it, for some practical issues of that kind. But that, that just gives you a taste of, of what it was like. Thank you. Uh, thank you for listening to me. I'm very intrigued with your brain must feel safe statement. And because I'm in an inner city school, oh. I know that a lot of the kids' brains do not feel safe. And yeah. I can tell that by the way they react with their fellow students and the teachers and yeah. all. Yeah. And I was wondering if you might have a few words of encouragement. <laughs> oh, my God. Wow. Right, right. Um, you know, that kind of challenge is just, it's so enormous because it pertains to the whole structure of their environment at home. And, you know, no matter what you do in the classroom, they're going to bring that environment into the classroom with them. I think the only thing that probably you can do is, um, you know, try to create a classroom setting in which they are factually safe you know is it, 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 I'm sure it's very difficult in that setting because you have um, uh, among other things you have all the other students in there right it's the other students very much who will prevent any individual from feeling safe right because they're always worried about what the kid next to them is going to think or what that um, bully over there is going to do to them after school, right? So, so the, I think the best you can do is try to create a, um, a setting, an environment in which, you know, at least the child feels safe with you. And then if you can reach the children generally and help them understand that, that they all need to feel safe and they can help one another feel safe if they want to and it's partly within their power and you know that's a, a would be a valuable thing to teach them per se right and so I think the best you can do is is uh, just try to work within the sphere that you have because the environmental things what they bring from the home and the streets and everything else the their cell phones, right? And oh my God, um, that's a challenge. One last question. Yeah, one last question. All right. No, I mean, if there is one last question. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody, do you feel like taking one more, David? If somebody has one, maybe, we're, maybe we went through all of them. Oh, here's one more. It's all right. I'm going to ask you about uh, Zen Buddhism or Taoism as a psychological instrument, as well as you were saying that Krishnamurti is more of a psychologist than a religious. The comparison and contrast in some respects. 
my um, understanding of Zen is probably not very deep, but there was a period of time when I was studying it. You know, I used to read Alan Watts and that sort of thing. Alan Watts used to, you know, come down here from the Bay Area and talk to Krishnamurti. And I think there were a couple times when Krishnamurti was in the Bay Area and he met up with Alan Watts in Sausalito. I think there's some parallels. I think Zen is um, similar in the sense that it's very psychological. It's, it's not too, as I understand it, it's not too metaphysical or it does not invoke much in the way of like supernatural explanations. So yeah, it has a very strong similar psychological component. And, and I think that a number of people have said, you know, there's a lot of parallels between Zen and Krishnamurti, just like, you know, this man pointed out, there's also parallels between Western psychology and Krishnamurti. People have said there's parallels between Hinduism and Krishnamurti. You can probably find parallels in a lot of places, but I'm sure you can with Zen Buddhism, in my judgment, more there than other places. Um, but I remember hearing him say more than once that, um, you know, that what he was saying had nothing to do with Freud or Jung or Zen or anything else. <laughs> so, so is that it? All right. Good.